So let's get started with our first presenter, potter and designer Jonathan Adler. Jonathan launched his namesake brand in 1993 after leaving his day job to pursue a career in pottery. Today, he has over 25 stores around the world, a thriving e-commerce business, and a full slate of residential and commercial projects. He has redefined modern design with his bold, glamorous work. And when you see an Adler piece, you know it's an Adler piece. Jonathan is a philanthropist, supporting many causes, including cancer research, animal rescue efforts, and the fight against AIDS. Please welcome Jonathan Adler. I started my business with like a real kind of f it, I have nothing to lose idea. I got fired from every job I ever had. I was sleeping with everybody in the office. I found myself at 27, unemployed, unemployable, and... I was like, I guess I'm gonna try to be a potter. I've done a terrible job of branding myself because nobody knows I'm a potter, but that's my most authentic self. And I think being a potter has really informed all of my design work because I definitely have an understanding of how stuff is made. When I started, there was nothing, me and clay. And it's like my world has gone like from this to like this, and it's crazy. Janine. Oh, hi, Jonathan. How are you? I'm good. I'm liking that. It has that, like, YSL 70s vibe. It does. That is sassy. My adorable husband always says that I'm sort of like Ariana Grande, like a little pop sprite who has this very positive approach to life. And then the other part of my personality is brooding and self-critical and depressive. Those are two essential parts to being a successful, creative person. You gotta have both. Hi, how are you guys? This is crazy. This is like the opposite of my real life where I am a potter, where I am in my pottery studio in a very insular, um, closed environment, so this is like crazy and expansive. I'm so happy to be here among so many creative people. Um, so, yay. Um, very different from a potter's normal life. So I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. I am a potter, I'm a designer, I'm a craftsperson. Basically, I make stuff. And I must say, from the very first moment I touched clay at summer camp, moi, summer camp, um, I felt a connection to clay. I knew this had to be my future. Um, I, and it wasn't just because my pottery counselor was super hot. It was because I loved clay. Um, so I always wanted to be a potter, but I didn't want to be this potter. I didn't want to be a hairy potter. Um, I know, right? Um, like, when you, if you were to all close your eyes right now and think about a potter, this is what you would think of, right? And this is the work you would imagine that he would be making. Um, a typical potter is sequestered in a garret in Vermont, making sad pots that he tries to hawk at rain-soaked craft fairs. Um, it's a sad life. It wasn't my truth, and I never wanted to be that potter, I just wanted to be a potter. Um, and so when I first started, I decided to make pottery that looked like this. Pottery that was clean and graphic and uplifting, um, and really was a reflection of me. So I'm here to talk about my pots, but I'm really treating this more as like a group therapy session, as an opportunity to talk to and with like-minded creative people like me and kind of tell you a bit about my creative process that I imagine you guys will relate to. Um, and really what I want to talk about is um, how much I hate myself. <laughs> I absolutely hate myself and I absolutely love myself. Um, and that that dichotomy between self-love and self-loathing I think is the fuel to 
all of my creativity, and I reckon you guys understand what I mean. Right? And I don't think people are that honest about it. You know, people, people when they talk at things, tend to sort of make everything seem effortless. And of course, the finished product should look effortless. It should look as if it was just always there. But I think we all know how torturous it is to get there. So I'll tell you a bit about my process. The self-love part. Self-love doesn't just grow hair on your palms. <laughs> loving yourself, loving yourself is really how ideas happen. You know, I, I'll tell you, like, I woke up one morning and I thought, there's a huge problem in the world. Why aren't there any mugs that are based on iconic rap stars? <laughs> and so I raced to my studio and I made some mugs. Um, I did like a Kanye, and I did a Run DMC. Um, and there they are in real life. Um, another day I woke up and I thought, hold on, grenades are beautiful. Like grenades are incredible forms. They're organic, they have like this incredible shape, and their, their texture is really beautiful. So I raced to my studio, um, and I made a group of vases that were inspired by grenades. That's moi at the wheel. Those are the pots in process. Um, and here they are finished. They kind of capture that menacing spirit of grenades. Um, and again, I woke up and thought, this has to happen. Uh, or um, I designed a hotel in Palm Springs called the Parker Palm Springs. And I realized there was a giant field at the Parker that absolutely needed a seven-foot-tall bronze banana. <laughs> right? Um, so I made a seven-foot-tall bronze banana. Um, and I think, I think that all of the ideas that I've talked about seem sort of preposterous. They seem, like, really insane. But of course, when I had them, I thought, these ideas are incredible because I had them. These are my ideas, so they're fabulous. So that's the, that's the very beginning of my creative process. The rest is where my self-loathing comes in. Um, I think that you need to be able to go from that little moment of inspiration, and then you, you need to start to put that into the world, and then once you start, you need to think, oh my god, this is going to be a failure. This is absolutely going to be a disaster because I am doomed to fail because I'm me. Um, <laughs> and I think that, that then you need to try to overcome that feeling of inevitable failure. So, for instance, doing this bronze banana took many, many months of prototypes and work to, to coax it into being. Um, it's an impossible balance to strike between love and hate, but it is one that I have been exploring in my entire career. There's the bronze banana. Right? Um, Love and hate, y'all, I actually do it explicitly, whether it's in needlepoint pillows or ceramic vases like you see here. Um, these are some giant lucite pills that I made, and I think, you know, I, I think of my, my career as being like an Alice in Wonderland, take the pill and go down the rabbit hole and see what happens, and I think these giant lucite pills express that. Um, there are so many reasons why you shouldn't do something, and of course they're correct. The truth is that every idea is a very bad idea. <laughs> it really is. Like, you know, every idea is a terrible idea, and um, to make anything, you really need to either be so dumb or so full of undeserved self-esteem that you don't know you're dumb. <laughs> and now I'll just show you more of my stuff. I've, I've, you know, I, I started out as a potter, and now, of course, I make everything for the home. I'm a retailer. I'm an interior designer. Um, I'm a very, very prolific dude, and a very, very glib and happy dude, and a very tortured dude. Um, I like to make stuff that's surreal. This is sort of a dreamy group of products, and I'll just tell you a bit. Like, there's a sofa there inspired by a cloud. I woke up one morning and thought, I got to make a sofa inspired by a cloud. Um, and I sketched it. And then I've been to the workshop 
for months trying to get the shape just right. It's that constant, like, I'm up, then I'm down. I'm, I'm tortured, I'm happy, I'm tortured, I'm happy. I'm like on an emotional roller coaster all the time. Um, and I think that my work is really a window into my mind. Um, as you can see, I make lots of stuff in lots of different media. I love surrealism. That's my dining room at my house in New York. Um, and that's my house in the country. You're seeing all my houses. I'm so great. <laughs> no, I've been very lucky. I have been a very lucky guy. Um, my creative odyssey has been a really unexpected success story. When I first started making pots, I thought, there's nothing to, to gain, there's nothing to lose, I just need to be creative. That was really how I started, and any success I've had has been purely a byproduct of an intense focus on creativity in everything I do. Um, so I, I, I suspect you guys can all relate to that, to the purity of design, I think really needs to be where everything starts. Um, and then it is a battle. It is a battle to make it all come through. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little more of moi. Moi. Drugs. It's so funny. I do lots of drug iconography. I don't take any drugs. I am like the most ascetic clean living person you can ever imagine. But I feel like design is an opportunity to express all different sides of myself and to live vicariously. So it's a, it, for me, my, my design journey really is a window into my somewhat tortured, somewhat gleeful um, mind. And I think my sort of design um, mantra really comes from En Vogue, free your mind, and the rest will follow. Um, they said it best. So that's my take on me. Um, and now Anne is going to come out to talk to me about me even more. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Proper high. Okay, so first of all, this is Jonathan's incredible little interior here, and this is the world's most comfortable, beautiful chair. So normally we don't like splurge for beautiful things like this, but here we go, he's here, so we're doing it. <laughs> so um, Jonathan, your company motto is like the best company motto ever. If your heirs won't fight over it, we won't make it. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so how does that mantra play out in your cre creative process? Well, it's a, it's a really crowded world. There's a lot of stuff in the world, um, but I try to make great stuff. I had a, I had a very um, chic grandmother who had incredible objets around her house, and when she died about 20 years ago, my brother and sister and I had fist fights over her stuff. <laughs> Like, and I thought, that's what I want my stuff to do. I want it to engender lawsuits between siblings. <laughs> like, that's how I'll know I've succeeded, if, some, if I make something that really stands the test of time. And as I said, it's a very crowded world. There's a lot of stuff, so I strive to make stuff that's perfectly crafted, very eccentric. Mm -hmm. I feel like the key to making things that people's heirs will fight over is being eccentric and true to yourself. So, um, yeah, everything I make is is is. Did you get good eccentric. stuff from your? I did. I won. You did. They're older than me, but I'm a scrappy little fighter. I'm not surprised. <laughs> so um, your work can be very provocative, and um, you are, as you said, amazingly prolific. So how do these ideas come to you? Like, so you had the cloud chair. Like you're just sitting there, and all of a sudden you have a vision. You know, people always say to me, like, what are your sources of inspiration? And it's such an impossible question to answer because the world is so crowded and busy. And it really, for me, it really does come back to the en vogue paradigm. Yeah. Free your mind. Yeah. Um, I get so many ideas um, while I sleep. Like, I dream about things and write them down. I spend a lot of time on my paddleboard in my Hamptons house. Um, 
thinking, and I really try to open my mind. It's funny, I don't take any drugs, as I said, but I, a lot of my work actually is sort of an homage to LSD and mind-opening <laughs> drugs. So I don't take them myself, but I sort of, I, I try to be on a journey of um, opening my mind. So um, you're a huge success, but you're also a do-gooder, which we at Adobe love. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what does using design for good mean to you? Um, or do you use design for good? I mean, I, I think, you know, of course, like anyone, I try to be as positive a force in the world as I can. I try to, you know, source things ethically and support charities. But if I'm being honest, I actually think of myself as very selfish. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of living, I'm almost like an Ayn Rand hero. Like, I, I have a very selfish um, odyssey. I make the stuff that I want to make. Mm -hmm. My career is really about me. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I sound glib, but I, I do think that the key to design success is being very, very like honest and personal in your work. And, and self-aware. You're self very self-aware. I am very self-aware, yeah. but I try not to be. <laughs> I think it's good to be self-aware. Well, I'm a ruminative person. I like really, uh, sometimes I fear that I think too much, and it's sort of, it's an odd balance I strike because I really have to do. Like, I'm a very restless guy. I'm like, I'm constantly making stuff, but I'm also constantly thinking, and I'm, I'm like on a roller coaster, dudes. It's tough. We had two quotes up there earlier. One was about anxiety being like a fuel for creativity, and the other was something like, don't think. Think inhibits creativity. Yes, those, that's my truth. OK, good. <laughs> so what's your, you showed us so many incredible things. What is your favorite, favorite Jonathan Adler design, and why? Wow, um, I guess my favorite thing is probably whatever I made most recently. <laughs> because as I said, it's like, what Every, did you make most recently? I actually just made this incredible um, new vase that has like, it's like this big and it has lips all over it. Um, and it's going to change the world. It's going to be the vase that is going to change the world. <laughs> I know it. Um, no, I, I think that, uh, as I said, you need to really feel like whatever you're doing is the thing. You need to be on that sort of journey of optimism and belief that um, whatever you're making is going to be incredible. Um, but I, you know, as you've said, I'm very prolific, I'm extremely lucky, and I live with my stuff, I love to look at it, I love what I do. That's so awesome. Okay, so what are you working on next? So, I mean, you're making so many things at once, like is there one big thing that you're focused on right now? Um, I am just doing more. I, I feel like my, my... How could you do more? I do more. I'm just like more, 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 like that disco song. I get a lot of inspiration from songs. More, more, more. How do you like it? How do you mind. like yeah. it? <laughs> Katy Perry, I'm hot, then I'm cold. I'm up, then I'm down. Um, <laughs> I'm doing more because I think that, you know, the, the truth is every, every career has a sell-by date. You know, everybody has a shelf life. We're all not going to do this forever. Um, We're not? I know, right? <laughs> You know, I, I would like to do this forever, but the reality is that careers end, and I feel like while I'm in the middle of it, I'm just trying to do as much as I can. My, my husband, Simon Doonan, who's a brilliant creative himself and whose books you guys should read, um, wrote in one of his books that he thinks life is like a giant disco cube. You know, one of those cubes in a disco where you stand up and you jiggle on it, um, and you jiggle around. Um, <laughs> And then he said, aging is when you finally are done jiggling, you fall off the cube, and it's somebody else's turn to jump up and jiggle. Yeah. Um, so I think that I am in the middle of jiggling around on the disco cube of life. I'm like pouring everything I've got into my jiggle. Um, <laughs> and I'm, you know, just doing more of it. Well, the jiggling's worked, and we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Jonathan Adler. Thank you guys so much. Such a pleasure.